Are we live? I say, are we live? We're a little late today, but we here. All right, we are live. Welcome to the show, everyone. We got a good show today. Hope y'all ready. What I'm about to show y'all is life changing. Welcome to the show. Welcome to the show. Welcome to the Jesus and God Ministries with Minister Derek. And I am Minister Derek. Welcome to the show, everyone. You know, I composed that song while I was in Bible college. 
and you could hear the earnest you can hear how true my feeling was I found out some things that we about to find out together um you know I was on the right path but not as good as I thought because I keep telling y'all it's easier for a camel to go through the needle of an eye than it is for a rich man to get to heaven. It's also easier for a cam for a camel to go through the needle of somebody bougie or somebody who think that they are morally upright. Or somebody who think that they better than somebody else. It's easier for that camel to go through that eye of the needle than it is for that individual. Uh, thank you, Naya. A lot of people who think that they're going to the next level because of the way they act. Because of the way... They do things. You know, it's a word that gets misplaced a lot. And I purposely try to clean it up for y'all, but I don't think nobody gets it. Faith without works. Has anybody heard that phrase? Faith without works. Hold on a second, y'all. I don't understand while we having problems here, there's no reason for it. You think that because you do things that that's your ticket, like you give to the poor or you go out and you give meals away or that's not going to get you up there. That's not going to get you to the next level. Some people think, well, I'm such a goody goody. That that's going to get you up there. There's nothing you can do. There is nothing that you can do. When you keep saying, well, I'm doing this right. I'm keeping this school open. I'm keeping this orphanage open. God owes me. He's going to bless me. I'm going. Don't work that way. Huh? It don't work that way. There ain't nothing you can do. There's nothing you can do to get you up there. The only thing that you really can do, and it's not you, but you got to make the first effort. You got to make the effort and let Jesus come into you. And let him do the work. You can't do nothing. Yeah. Well, I sacrifice and I do this and I help them. It, you, that doesn't get you in there. You got to have a relationship with Jesus and God. You think that your physical works down here does not impact what they see. You could be the lowest of the low, the bummiest of the bum. But if you walking with Jesus and God, even though you might be at the bottom of the barrel, you might be on skid row, you're going. But somebody that's rich and walking by, mm, mm, how y'all live here? That's the person that's going in a lake of fire. What do you mean? I donate to big churches and I... You don't have a relationship with God. To get that, you have to let Jesus into you. Let him go to work. 
and let him be that bridge between you and God. If that's not occurring, it don't matter what you do. It don't matter how much you donate. It don't matter how many people you save in the fire. All that don't mean nothing if you don't have that relationship. There's a song that I've already saw them play, but y'all know it has the pastor of my Bible college in the first few seconds. And he's saying a phrase that comes out of Matthew. Lord, Lord, have I not prophesied in your name? Have I not done many wonderful works? Notice. You're saying what you've done. You don't have no power. They got the power. Why do you keep talking about what you did? Well, I did this and I did that. Are you walking with them? Before you do any works, are you walking with with Jesus and God. If you cannot tell me that, don't tell me about, well, you know, I did this and I got up and I sacrificed and I go to the church every day and, and I do this and I provide for the needy and I, if you're not walking with them, all of that don't matter. You can build up as many things in that book as you want. Are you walking with them? Just doing works is not enough. Being a good person is not enough. Being holier than vile and not sinning is not good enough. What you're doing is saying, my actions, what I do with my hands, is what's going to get me to the next level. Eh, eh, eh. Kill that thought. You got to be walking with them. If you're not walking with them, you're not going anywhere but in that lake of fire. That's most important. Because if Jesus can say, I don't know you. I know about the things you've done, but I don't know you. Can I say that again? I know and see the things that you've done, and but I don't know you. I don't have a relationship with you. You don't belong to me. So why do I care? Get away from me. That's going to be the answer. That's going to be the answer. I always tell you about how people moan and, and complain. But people that moan and complain, if Jesus and God know them, they can make it. But people who never complain, who are always cheery, but don't walk with Jesus and God, they're not going nowhere. You can be St. Helen, Mother Teresa. You don't know Jesus and God, you're not going to get anywhere. And this is what the story of Job was trying to teach. And I'm going to be honest with you. The story of Job soured me for a long time. How you doing, Liz? And it soured a lot of people. Because first of all, if the devil is supposed to be our enemy, why would God call him over? This got me for a long time. Why would God call, last thing I'm going to do is call my enemy over and say, hey, enemy, come on over here. Thank you, Liz. Enemy, come on over here. I want you to look at the best thing I got. 
And the enemy going to say, yeah, you know, you only got it because, you know, you did this. But, you know, let me have it for a minute and then we'll see how you do. All right, man, you'll get my face. Why am I going to give you my best to destroy? They say they was no, there was no man on earth like God. I mean, like Job. I'm sorry. There was no man on earth like Job. Job was us right. He was upright. Upright. You couldn't touch him. But he had one flaw. And this is the reason why God allowed the devil to take him. To teach us all a lesson. And this is what you got to see. What was the lesson? Job did everything. He sacrificed animals for his kids just in case they did something wrong. He helped the people. The man was great. He was generous. Didn't have a bad thing to say about anybody. But here's the key. Because he did all that, he thought that was all he had to do. Because he did all that. Let that marinate for a second. What's wrong with what I just said? If you listen to what I said earlier, what's wrong with what I just said? Job thought that the things that he did The things that he did himself that God owed him something. God going to take care of me because I'm doing these things. And a lot of people got to ang get angry when they when they see God speak. And the things that God is saying, people are getting offended and afraid by, but you got to listen to what he's saying. He's saying, you talk about, you get up and do some daggone sacrifices. You, I make the daggone sun come up every day. I make it rain. What do you do? You get some homeless people something to eat. Really? Every one of those stars in the sky got a dang on name. I make sure you can see that moon every night. I make sure you got water to drink. I make sure the plants grow. And I do it because I want to. Because I love you. But you saying because you follow some laws... And you do some nice things that I'm obligated. I keep you alive. You got air to breathe. My spirit flowing through your veins. I don't owe you nothing. Well, you know, I go to church every Sunday, you know, so, and I put money in the plate, so I know I'm getting blessed. I know I'm going. You really think God cares about that? If you're doing something because you expect to get something back, you're doing it for you. Well, you know, I got more money than that person, and without this town, nobody would survive, and, you know... And if he wanted to, he could take it away from you in one swoop. Then what? Then what? If you're not walking with Jesus and God, anything you do down here is irrelevant. And he gives you that gift for free. Doesn't cost you a thing. Other than your faith. Faith don't cost money. Believing don't cost money. 
Letting them come in and do their work on you does not cost money. When you go, well, you know, and I spent this and I bought that. They offering you a chance to go to the next level at no charge. All they ask you to do is let them in. Let them claim you. That's all they ask of you. You ain't got to do nothing else because they will go to work inside of you. When you start to follow them and you actually start to really understand the teachings and the things that you are reading, you're not going to want to do those things. But it don't matter if you are a prostitute, if you're a drug addict, whatever you are. If you got that relationship with Jesus and God, that's what's most important. And for people that sit around weighing out, I sit in the first row of the church or I'm the deacon, you know, I'm the first lady. And look at you, look at you looking all nasty. And look at you, don't you want to be like me? The answer is no. Because you're going in a lake of fire. Why well, I want to follow you? You know, I got, look at the pretty hat. I got a pretty hat on every week and I look good. And I'm in here shouting. I got the dance steps down. And Do you know God and Jesus? If you don't, you're going in a lake of fire. I can't make it no simpler than that. Pure and simple. Well, you know, think about it. Jesus came down here. Did Jesus hang with the church people? No, he didn't. I already told y'all. Everybody couldn't afford a Bible back then. See, you ain't got no excuse today. Back then, everybody didn't have a Bible. So you needed to go to church. Also, they didn't have social media. So if the leaders wanted to get something out to the people, they would use the church. See, the church was the center of life. It was the center of life. And it was held on Saturday, not Sunday. So that you had your day of rest on Sunday. The Romans moved it to Sunday because it was also a day of celebration for one of the pagan gods. So they moved it to Sunday. They said, best friend is in the hospital having a baby. I hope to make it through the sermon. Well, Liz, if you're hearing this part, this is the best part because I'm telling you life-giving information. A lot of people think that just by being good. And see, this is the problem. We talked about this last week about the law. Everybody still want to follow the law of Moses. Some of them laws are pretty good. But them laws are not going to get you over. That's the part that nobody getting. It's not the laws. It's you walking with God. And this is what the people don't get because the Israelites kept making a mistake. And see, the Israelites, were, they had God with them. They actually had Jesus with them, hanging above them in the cloud every day. But you know what? Even right there, he was still distant enough that guess what? Well, you know, 
He can't see what I'm doing. I'm going to go ahead and do what I want to do. You know, eh? I'm going to go ahead and do me. You know what? All the other people got kings. How come we ain't got a king? We want a king. So you got Jesus down there with you in the cloud. Now they already has said they didn't want Jesus to talk to them anymore. At the mountain. In the desert. They said they didn't want they wanted Jesus to talk to Moses and then Moses tell them what he said. Now they saying, we want a king. You had a king. You king with Jesus. But now you want a king. Do you think that that made God happy? That they just rejected Jesus as, as their king and they want a human being to be their king. He said, but okay, go ahead. What you want? Every time they disobeyed, God would say, okay, well, you think you can do better without me? Go ahead. And then the Pharisees and the Hippotites and the Jebusites, who, whoever their enemy was, will come in there and take them over. Then they will realize their mistake and they will start groaning and moaning. And then he will come back and rescue them. And they'd be good for a year, you know. Then they start to forget and go back to doing what they want to do. And it will happen all over again. But the difference between then and now, even though they would temporarily forget about God, they were still with him. And he was still with them to the point that he said, this is not working. So come on, Jesus, we got to use you again. Come on back down here. We're going to have you go down there, show them how I want you to behave. Show them how to pray. Show them how to do everything. And then you're going to die for them. And you're going to make a way for them to come. Be here with me. And people still, eh, well, you know, he died on the cross. Eh, you know. That's all good and everything. And I am. But just saying that I believe it is not enough. You got to have a connection with them. Now, Job did everything right, but he did not have a connection with Jesus or God. And when the devil did strike him down, And you got to remember, it's with the permission of God. Because Job was not walking with God. He may have been the most upright man on earth according to the old laws. But he was not walking with Jesus or God. So he was expendable. He wasn't going anyway. Go ahead. Devil, like, what? I can have him? Yep, just can't kill him. <coughs> I can have him? Devil go off. <laughs> not realizing, wait a minute. Why would he give me his best? There's got to be a catch here. Why would he give me the best person on earth to go torment. But see, the devil's stupid. Sorry. I'm going to say he's stupid. You know what's going to happen to him? It's been about, what, 2,200 years? And he still ain't stopped. Then he's stupid. Because he's stupid. There's no, and there's no other way you can say it. He ain't smart. Because I would say, nah, nah, bro. I, I, I ain't going out like this. Nah, we got to, we got to stop here. Wait a minute. I'm going to do all this work and then I'm going to wind up in the lake of fire. Anyway, 
Nah. But yeah, it's his punishment. Doesn't realize he's being punished. He's also being used to weed out those that are going and that are not going. So, Job's friends, his wife, even the devil himself keep trying to tell him, you did something wrong. And Job is like, I've done nothing wrong. I've done this, I've done that, I've done this, I've done that. I can't figure out why God is letting this happen. He owe me. Look at all the great things I did. All Job had to say was, you know what? I keep talking about God. I keep talking at God. But am I talking with God? Can I say that again? I'm talking about. I'm talking at. But am I walking with God? Do I have a relationship with God? Does God know me intimately? If you cannot say yes to that, you better find a way. And I told you how to do it. You better build that relationship. Because Job was the best upright man on earth. But they don't know him. I was telling you to, to load your book of life up. They don't know you. What good is it? There's some great things you done here. But uh, who are you? I don't know you. Next. But that's what's going to happen. And Jesus said, you must love me more than anybody else. And for him to believe that, he must know you. If he don't know you, you know better off than somebody over there killing people. Somebody selling poison to their people. Somebody raping and pillaging their people. You know better than them because they don't know you. I can tell you somebody on death row that gets to know Jesus and God got a better chance of going than you. That's rough right there. Because normally, people have to be at their lowest. And this is why they don't like teachers of the law. They really don't care for churches. The Romans cared for the church. The church was a way to indoctrinate the people, to unify the people, to get the people in line. The church stopped being for worship of God. It became worship of government. That's why Jesus go teach on the hill. This is why the church is so full with strife right now. It's more important for you to have a connection with Jesus and God. Get your Holy Spirit activated. And to be honest, you don't need church. But church is a good way to go meet people and go hang out and exchange ideas. It's good to fellowship. But don't get lost. That relationship with Jesus and God is most important. Liz said her uh, best friend is in the hospital having a baby. 
She always make it through the sermon. Naya said, congrats to her Liz. Liz says, thank you, Naya. She's been in labor since 8 p.m. on Friday. Whoa. Naya said, I wish her a healthy birth and process throughout. And so do I, Liz. And thank you, Naya, for this uh, topic. So, all right, y'all. Check out this video. It's not too long. But you watch it, right please. Brain full of activity? That's... This is inspiring philosophy. The book of Job is the one book of the Bible that can make a Christian shrivel. When a skeptic brings up a question about Job, the average Christian usually sidesteps the issue or throws out an answer that is not satisfying. Because on the surface, the book of Job sounds terrible. It looks as though as if God tortures his most faithful servant on earth just to win a bet with Satan. How can we claim God is loving after something like that? However, that is just a surface understanding, and I want to show this is not the case. I personally used to be troubled by Job and avoided reading it altogether. But a few years ago, I became convicted about this. So I read it through and began to truly think about it. What I found was is that this surface understanding was very false. What is actually going on is a deep message of love and a warning to Christians or those who claim to follow God. I will not touch on the debate of whether Job is a work of fiction or literal history. Some scholars have argued it was composed as an ancient work of fiction and not literal history, sort of akin to Jesus' parables, meaning it is a story for teaching purposes, but not a literal historical occurrence. That is an interesting debate, but beside the point. If we focus on that, we miss the rich and deep theological teachings Job is trying to give us. What I want to show are three things. First, although Job was a good moral person, he had a warped view of God, which distanced him from God. Second, God had a good reason to allow what happened to Job. And finally, this book is not written to lost sinners, but is directly written to those who claim to follow God. It has a deep and important message for Christians today. First point, Job had a warped view of God. The first verse opens, describing the moral character of Job. It says in verse 1, There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was blameless and upright, one who feared God and turned away from evil. Now the skeptic will say, See, he faithfully followed God. God had no reason to hand him over to Satan. But what the Christian should look at this description and say, so what? So what? Good works do not mean a person is following God. Doesn't Jesus and Paul teach that good works won't save us? You can live a good life and still completely miss the point of the gospel? Jesus says in Matthew 7, 21 to 23, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name? And do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Paul said... Oh, that's Paul right there. That's Paul right there. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Let that marinate in your head. I never knew you. Yes, you did all these great things. But who are you? I don't know you. Can't say I ain't looked down and seen you, but I don't know you. Why don't I know you? Because you haven't come to me and let you in. And let me into you. So I don't know you. So all that don't mean nothing. I don't know you. Says in his letter to the Ephesians, For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is a gift from God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. Just being a good person and doing good works doesn't mean someone is doing the will of God as Jesus. See that? Now we covered this last week. Just because you're good and just because you do good works, that doesn't mean you're doing the will of God. What is the will of God? For you to walk with him accept him but for you to ignore him i'm doing all these great things and that's all i got to do and there you go i'm going all the way no it don't work that way i need y'all to understand this 
Get it in your head. There's nothing you can do to earn this salvation. It's called grace for a reason. Because God graciously gives it. And he gives it out for free. But here's the key. You got to let go. And you got to let God. People say that phrase, they don't know what it means. They think let go means, well, you know, I ain't got to do nothing. I ain't got to work. I ain't got to do nothing. God going to do it all. That's not what that phrase means. Let go means you got to let go of everything that you want to do. You got to let go and become new. Become like a new child. And let God and Jesus come inside you through your Holy Spirit, which he breathed into you. And let them change you from the inside out. If you're not doing that, then you're not walking. And if you're not walking, nothing you can do on this earth is going to get you to the next level. Jesus says, and it would be helpful to compare this verse to another passage hey, no, about a back different ahead. righteous man in Genesis named Noah. In Genesis 6, 9, we read, Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his generation. Noah walked with God. So if we compare these two verses, we see they are both blameless good men, but only one walked with God. Whoa, pause that right there. Pause that right there. Now, this is Job 1, whose name was, oh, Job, 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 whatever, whose name was Job, and that man was blameless and upright. And look down here. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his generation. But watch this. Noah walked with God. Did it say that Job walked with God? Said he feared God and turned away from evil. But, did Noah walk with God? I want y'all to notice this. Noah is better than Job for one simple reason. He walked with God. The Bible teaches that being a good person is not enough because Romans 3.23 says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. You can't earn God's salvation and blessings by works. Salvation is a gift by grace. It is about walking with God. Now, I'm not saying what Job was doing was bad. He was obviously doing good things. But we need to look past the action and look at the motive. And this subtle yet important fact is missing from the moral description of Job. Okay, so what the skeptic can say, this is just one verse. Well, let's keep reading. I want to look at a couple verses which individually may not mean much on their own, but together they can make a cumulative case. We get through the description of Job's wealth, and we are told in verse 5, And when the days of the feast had run their course, Job would send and consecrate them, and he would rise early in the morning and offer burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, It may be that my children have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus Job did continually. This is another subtle yet important fact. Job is not relying on the relationship he has walking with God, but relying on the works and sacrifices he is offering up. The entire mindset implied is, what if my children die and they don't have all their sins paid for? God surely won't be appeased by that. I better make sure I do enough sacrifices so they can get into heaven. See, it's all about works. Job wants to follow God, but he thinks it's all about what he does to earn God's grace and blessings. It's not about walking with God like Abraham or Noah did. It is about pause. I want y'all to understand what he just said. Job did all these things. And he thinks that in return. He's going to get to move on. I'm doing all these things. So God owe me. He's obligated to me. No. You can do all those things, and that's great. But you got to have an active relationship, a continual relationship with God through Jesus. 
You keep talking about what you want to do. I don't know no human being that's going to allow you to go to the next level. So you worrying about what you're doing with your hands. If you could do it, why would you need God? I just asked that point blank. If you could do it on your own, why do you need God? So wouldn't it be important to make sure that you have a vital relationship with Jesus and God and let go of these things that you feel yourself wanting to do? I want to go do this. Let them direct you. They'll direct you where they want you to go. They made you. They don't know what you should do with your life. You can't trust them. Well, you know, I let them in a little bit, but you know, I, I got to maintain control here. You know, I, who are you? They don't owe you nothing. There's a billion people on the planet. You think that they miss, they can just make another one of you. Be honest. If you that important and you won't come walk with them, why can't they go find somebody that will or make somebody that walk with them? Seriously. I'm being honest. If they didn't love us and didn't want us all to go, they could just wipe us all off the planet. But we given the opportunity. We given the choice. But we got to just reach for it. We got to just come ask. Let's continue. Job trying to appease God with works and sacrifices, which as Jesus points out in Matthew chapter 7, among other places, is missing the point. You can't buy your way into heaven. It's all given by grace. This is something Abraham understood. In Genesis 15, Abraham knew nothing of God, but he believed in him. And Paul tells us in Romans 4 that God counted him righteous because of his faith, not because of his works. But Job is not believing by faith. He is trying to earn it. Let's move on. We'll come back to the conversation between Satan and God in the second part. For now, let's look at how Job reacts when he loses everything. At the end of chapter 1, Job loses everything in a single day, his wealth and his family. Job's reaction starts in verse 20. Then Job rose and tore his robe and shaved his head and fell on the ground in worship. And he said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this, Job did not sin or charge God with wrong. Now, this pause, pause, pause. But what did Job not do? I want to keep this in y'all head. What did Job not do? He tore his clothes. He sat in the ashes. He said, even though all this has happened, God is still good. But why hasn't he called out to the Father or Jesus? Either one. The same person, why can't he called out? Lord, how, why you let this happen to me? I thought we were doing it. Nothing. Well, you know. I'm just going to have to work harder and I'm going to have to have more cattle and I'm going to have to give more away and I'm going to have to do more sacrifices because obviously I did something wrong, but I'm not going to blame God and, and I still love him. And, but you're not talking to God. You're not talking to Jesus. You're not asking them why. You're pretty much saying, well, you know, you gave me the money. I mean, you gave me the money and you took it. You gave me a family and you took it. Okay. Well, why not? Lord God, why? What have I done? N none of that. Instead, you acting like you a victim, which you are, but you're not coming to the people who you think victimized you. It'd be like if somebody 
stole your money and you knew who it was. But you don't want to go to the person because they might beat you up. So you go steal some money and put it back from somebody who you know you can beat up. This is what Job is doing. Well, you know, he gave it to me and he took it away. I must have done something wrong, uh, you know. So, you know, it's all good. And, you know, I, I'll just sit here and wait to die. And, you know, instead of talking and saying, what have I done? What's wrong, G? What's going on? He has no connection with God or Jesus. He has no direct connection. He just has a notion of what he's been told they want him to do. But he's never asked them, what do you want me to do? Are y'all understanding what I'm saying? Let me take a check real quick before we continue. Naya says, this is great, BD. Thank you for covering it. As a teen, I always wondered why God allowed pain and suffering. Who was he allowing it to happen to? That's something you got to ask. Who was he allowing it to happen to? Because see, when you separate yourself from God, why does he have an obligation for your well-being? Somebody talk to me. When you separate yourself from God, when you say, put on that, I'm going to do what I want to do. Well, now you're responsible for yourself. So if you live in a neighborhood, they have earthquakes, tornadoes, and you choose to live there, and you're not walking with God or Jesus, why do you expect them to protect you? I'm just asking. Why do you expect them to protect you? You'll spend money on a fancy house. You'll spend money on a fancy car. You'll spend money to go out to a fancy restaurant, but you won't take 10 minutes of your time a day to make sure you're still connected with Jesus and God. Somebody talk to me. But you really expect them to follow you around, to nitpick at you, to kick you in the butt, the mother all over you. They tried that. It didn't work. All they ask is that you come to them. Come as you are and drop all of your inhibitions. Just let everything go. That's it. And let them take you over. And then you'll have an intimate conversation. You'll be able to say, what am I doing wrong? I thought I was doing what you were directing me to do. Why am I? Why is this happening? Then you got the right to say something. But when you ignoring them and you expect them to sit here and follow behind you when you ain't doing nothing that they ask you to do, but you expect them to protect you just because you gave some money to the orphanage or just because you volunteer at the homeless shelter, you think that they supposed to pat you on the back and, and collar you and follow you around. Now, I'm not going to say that they might not allow you to go do that because it needs to be done, but don't ask for no special favors. I'm just saying, why should they care? Seems like a good moral thing to say, and many commentators have noted that. But for me, it seems a bit odd. By God's grace, I have never lost everything in a single day. But I can honestly say that if I did, this is not how I would react. My line of thought would be more like Jesus and would he yell on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I'd be yelling, God, why are you letting this happen? My reaction would be more like King Hezekiah in 2 Kings 20, as a cry out to God for deliverance. My reaction would be more like Jeremiah's in the Book of Lamentations, as a cry out to God of the horror that happened and question what is going on. It would be very hard for me to say, the Lord gave and the Lord has taken away, blessed be the name of the Lord. In fact, it would be very hard for me not to talk to God, 
and only talk about him. Oh. In fact, throughout scripture, when something bad happened, the man or woman of God cries out to God for help. They don't usually talk about God like Job does here. So the interesting thing we need to note is Job doesn't address God. He talks of God. He doesn't say to God, you gave and you take away, but I'll continue to bless your name. If he walks with God, why not talk to him? So what does this mean? There is a misguided belief in America called the prosperity gospel. Those who hold to it believe they can claim whatever they want by faith. If they want a new car, then they just say, I claim a new sports car in the name of Jesus. They believe God is getting them the new car. I wish I was making this up, but it is sadly true. It doesn't appear that they walk with God. They try to use God to get the things they want. Job's line of thought seems to be similar to that. That as long as I bless God, he will have to hear me and reward me by fixing this. It's not about crying to God for help, but crying out so God will hear him and see how good he is being and follow through and reward that. This implies little evidence of a personal walk or relationship with God. It seems to be all about trying to appease God so he will fix the situation. Let's keep going. We're looking at pieces in the text to get a bigger picture of who Job was. Things get more interesting in chapter 2. Satan comes back, and this time causes Job to be covered with painful sores. Then his wife said to him, Do you still hold fast your integrity? Curse God and die. But he said to her, You speak as one of the foolish women would speak. Shall we receive good from God, and shall we not receive evil? In all this, Job did not sin with his lips. Now look at that last part in verse 10. In all this, Job did not sin with his lips. That is interesting because in chapter 1, after the turmoil hits, it says, Job did not sin or charge God with wrong. We see it goes from Job not charging God to Job not sinning with his lips. Why the change? Why not just repeat the same phrase that Job did not sin or charge God with wrong? Because something different has happened in Job, and we see that come out in chapter 3. Now, Job's friends show up and they watch him suffer for seven days, until finally Job says in chapter 3, Let the day perish on which I was born, and the night that said, A man is conceived. Let that day be darkness. May God above not seek it, nor light shine upon it. Let gloom and deep darkness claim it. Let clouds dwell upon it. Let the blackness of the day terrify it, and so on and so on. Job goes on for the rest of the chapter wishing for death, wishing he had never been born. He speaks as if he loves death over life, and there is more speaking about God and not speaking to God yet. It's as if Job is writing a love letter to death. But see, that is interesting because Proverbs 8.36 says, in speaking about the wisdom of God, All who hate me love death. The Bible teaches God is life, and to reject life and want death is to reject God. So let's go back to this comparison between these two verses. Job at first will not sin or charge God, but later it says Job will not charge God with his lips. Or in other words, he will not openly speak what he feels in his heart towards God. At this point in chapter 2, he has hate towards God, and it is obvious in his wish for death, because all who hate God, who is life, love death. But Job won't outright say it. Why? If that is what he feels, then why not admit it? If Job walked... That's a good point. If that is not what Job felt, if that's what he felt, why won't he admit it? Because he was taught incorrectly that good things come from God and bad things come from God. Good things are going to happen and bad things are going to happen. But if you don't have a relationship with God, you can't question him on anything. And I know that somebody somewhere is going to say, yeah, well, well, what about children? Things happen to children. But are their parents walking with God? Even if the children don't know, the parents should, and the parents should be walking with God. And that should help the children. You know, St. Paul says that if you are in a marriage and one person is a believer and one person is not a believer, but the non-believer is still willing to stay married, then the believer relationship through God will cover the non-believing spouse. So if it'll cover 
the non-believing adult? Why shouldn't it cover the children who might not know better? Because I know somebody's going to ask that. But you're going to say, what about children who don't have the knowledge? One of their parents should be walking with God. They have the knowledge, but will they choose to use it? If they don't, nobody will get any protection. And nobody can ask for it. If you're not walking with God, you shouldn't be asking them for anything. You shouldn't be expecting no help. Let's continue. With God, why isn't he just being honest with him like Hezekiah, Jeremiah, or Christ did? Why is he hiding what he feels? Because Job still thinks his entire good fortune was built on appeasing God. God for Job was a giant genie in the sky or a divine vending machine. <laughs> as long as Job says the right prayers, does the right sacrifices, says the right things, then God is expected to bless him. Following God was not a relationship, like with a fellow loved one, but was a formula. A good God, plus doing good works, equals a good life. As long as he did his part, God was expected and is supposed to do his part and make him happy and fill his pockets. But it was all about Job. God became a means to an end. Someone like Job would be using God to get the things he really wants and not God himself. This is clear in chapter 1. Job doesn't cry out to God for help. He tries to appease God by blessing his name. In chapter 2, his wife says he should curse God and die, which again implies it's all based on works. If you do something bad like cursing, you will get bad back from God. But Job doesn't do that, even though he feels it. Instead, he is trying to appease God somehow for the time being by saying good things and not cursing God. With this mindset, it seems as though as if he thinks he can earn God's favor again and get back his old life, which is why he won't openly say what he feels in his heart. But after seven days and trying to deal with his circumstances while not cursing God and still trying to show his goodness, Job finally starts to admit what he feels. He gives up and quite frankly says, the formula is not working. It's broken. I'm doing the right things, but the divine genie is not giving me what I deserve for persevering. So just let me die. Now, I'm not saying all of Job's lamenting was not crying out to God. After this initial response, he definitely begins to cry out to him. But we are looking at how he initially handled the situation, as that will reflect what he thinks is the best way to handle the turmoil. Once that doesn't work, then we see he begins to look elsewhere and cry out to God for help and answers. However, the point here is he initially doesn't do that, which I will argue in a bit is what God was trying to get at. Now, if you need to be more convincing, look at how Job's friends treat the situation. They tell him over and over he did something wrong and he needs to repent. A good God plus bad works equals a bad life. Job did something wrong and he needs to fix it so he can earn God's blessings again. God will even bless him with riches if he does and says the right things, which is very similar to the prosperity gospel. So the important thing to remember about this is people tend to hang out with other like-minded people. Your close friends are usually those who you agree with most. And in ancient cultures, this was even more likely, with much more racism and class segregation. Those who came to see Job are his closest friends. Now, are you going to suggest that Job didn't think at all like them before this happened? We tend to draw closer to the people we think more like. And so Job's friends are telling him the core doctrine of their shared beliefs. You obviously must have messed up, Job, or this wouldn't have happened. You must have said the wrong things or acted wrong. And this is why the divine vending machine has spit back at you. Job had the same idea in his mind, but the opposite look, since he claims he should have earned the good life. Look at Job's final confession, which resonates through the rest of his lamenting. In chapter 29, Job lists all his good works. I delivered the poor who cried for help, and the fatherless who had none to help them. I put on righteousness, and it clothed me. My justice was like a robe and a turban. I was eyes to the blind and feet to the lame. I was a father to the needy, and so on and so on. Then in chapter 31, he denies having done anything wrong. In both of these chapters, he points out he is blameless in both areas. He never coveted another woman, harmed servants, or forsook the less fortunate. He talks about his morality, sexual purity, generosity, benevolence, truthfulness, etc. He abstained from all sins, such as lust, greed, envy, deceit, vengeance, and violence. Job was a blameless man. 
and he had the list to prove it. And that is exactly the problem. Nothing in his that list. That is the problem. I'll stop right there. That is the problem. Once again, he keeps listing what he has done. But like the narrator says, did he do it? Because he's walking with Jesus and God and they directed him to do it? Or did he do it because he thinks that life is a deal? You know, I do good works and you're going to give me blessings for it. I do good works and you're going to give me money. I do good works and you'll give me power. I do good works and you'll give me farmland. It's like he's trying to make a deal. But what does he have to bargain with? Let me say that again. What does he have to bargain with? You really think that God need him to do these things? Why does he think that God needs him? He needs God. And he's thinking, I'm going to do these things. And yeah. Because you got three friends there and your wife. And that's it. Where are all the people at? Where are all the people you're trying to appease? Why are they not there supporting you? But who would be there no matter what, no matter where you are? Whether you're in the bottom of a cave, whether you locked away under the jail cell, who would be there? Jesus and God will. But you got to call them in. And you're doing everything, I this, I that, I did this, I that, I. You can't do it alone. And I'll keep bringing it home. You cannot do it alone. Let me set the chat real quick. Let me look on the phone down here. We full screen. Let me see what I'm missing here. Uh, and then she said, yes, very nice. We had bad winds and storm last night. Today, 64 and all wind. Yeah, that's how it is here. Nice a good NNC, better than an avalanche. NNC said, yes, amen, Nia. Some things I still question. Nia said, yes, NNC. She said, uh, yes, l l last I saw on the news was 10 deaths in four, four states. Nia said, oh, my NNC is awfully sad. She said, terrible NNC. And she said, yes, prayers. Nia said, children, BDS. She said, innocent babies and kids, BD. Naya said, they don't know any better. And she said, yes, and she, she said, animals. She said, good people suffer all the time as well. Yes, Naya. She said, uh, babies can't walk. And then she said, so BD, are you saying God took your daughter because you and your mother, you and her mother, weren't walking with him. She said, anyone else spinning? Naya said, not at the moment. Liz said, I was. Liz said, it's back now. Naya said, I was before. So anyone heard from the driver? He was here last night. And then see, I just saw a news clip. South Carolina parts got hit real bad too. Oh no. Um, I think I already answered the thing about the children without even knowing it. <laughs> but um, good people suffer all the time as well. And I covered that too. Just because you're good, you ain't walking with Jesus and God don't mean nothing. We covered that. NNC says, B BD, so are you trying to say God took your daughter because you and your mother weren't walking with him. Uh, actually, no name by cares. To be honest with you, dear, I actually broke away from God. I was mad at God. I was mad at God for a while. 
And then one day I was sitting there, and I mean, literally, this, I don't know if the car accident or this, which one messed up my life more. But let me tell you, I was sitting, and something just said to me, the mother had bad genetics. And she did. She had sickle cell anemia and other issues. Her mother was walking around with her oxygen tank. And her mother was not heavy set. She was not fat. And they said that my child had a bad heart. I got a bad heart. And the child's grandmother had a bad heart. My mother died of a leg clot. But the mother of my child, she died. I mean, she didn't bring home. Every, every child that she gave birth to, there was something wrong with. Her first child didn't make it home at all. Her second child, they had to remove her eyeball because the cancer was so horrid that it would have ravaged her whole body. And the little girl, she spoiled because the grandparents spoiled her, but she is smart as a whip. You could talk to her and you could forget that she was a child. That's how smart she was. I wonder what she's doing today. She's probably a doctor or something. She was very intelligent. She had a son. He has wicked ear infections. She has not produced a healthy child. Our child had heart problems. But this baby was trying to walk at 30 days years old. You could hold her up and she would sit there and try and walk. And she would look at you like she understood everything that you said to her. And I realized, you know what? The genes on her family, on her side, everything is sped up. That these children are not going to have a long lifespan. So everything is sped up. And I realized. I literally could hold her by the hand and could, and she would walk around the room. Normally, they have to be 18, 19 months to be doing that. We were doing that at 30 days. So even though it was only 40 days, it was like so much was crammed into that 40 days. Do y'all understand what I'm saying? And I started to realize, you know what? You got more out them 40 days than most people would have got out of two years. And then the race became on because by her dying so young, it released me from the grip of that situation, which I would have, which I had manned up and took, but it released me of the grip of that situation. But also now I got a goal. I got somebody that's waiting for me. And she's going because she didn't. She didn't 
have enough time to do anything wrong. And I got to make sure that I keep. Because remember what I said. The parent relationship with Jesus and God has got to cover the child. And I got to make sure that I cover her even though I don't think she need it. And make sure that I'm good so that we can reunite. And I'm going to see my child again. And I look forward to that every day. But if I want to see her again, I got to make sure that I stay in connection with Jesus and God. And not talk at them. Not talk about them. But talk to them. Because I ask them every day. Why are all these demonic channels so much more popular? With all the great shows and content that we've had, how come the people ain't catching on? And they keep telling me patience. And it's hard sometimes. They keep saying patience. Because see, time to them is different than time to us. They've been around since the beginning. So four or five thousand years of them are like a dang on day. To us, it's like, yeah, man, we, we only got 60 to 80 years down here. Y'all got to speed it up. They don't see it that way. We're going to get there. In their time. Not in our time. And when we try to. Uh, do things in this sector. That go on to more attention. It worked at first. But that's not what we do. And eventually the people go away. And we wind up right back where we was. So we got to be patient and stop getting bogged down. And stop letting people say, ah, oh, you only got five people watching. Ah, you only got six people watching. I don't understand why you do it. I do it because I was commanded to. And if you got a problem with that, then you go take it up with them. Go ask them why they asked me to come to YouTube. Don't ask me. Let me check the chat and then we'll, we'll get back. We said I'm back now. Anybody heard from the driver? And she says, wow. Um, no, neighbor case. Um, uh, what are you saying, wow, about sweetie? Because yeah. I tell you, uh, I was angry at first. And eventually, everything that was negative was removed. And if I had a, stuck it out. If I had a stuck it out, 
I took the easy way out. I was working a job and it was the summertime. And the summertime was the worst time financially because the people could take the bus or they could walk because it was summertime. I actually started trying to go to Bible college at the wrong time. But if I had stuck it out and just went without things, I had already made a friend, a beautiful young lady too. And she didn't, she didn't have any family. She actually had an adopted family. And that was our bond. But things got bad and I got financially behind and, and I couldn't keep it up. I should have. I should have. I'll regret that. But anyway. Let me get back to this. You said BD was waiting to ask, should we save it for the other channel? Well, um, let's all, let's finish this video. And then uh, we'll get into the storm mentions faith in God or trust in him. Nowhere does he say he trusts in God's control, but it clearly shows he has faith in his own works, which should have delivered him. His work should have been his ticket to why he deserved the good life. He doesn't even hint to the possibility of some imperfection or that he didn't do what was needed to earn the good life. In other words, Job's report was accurate, but it reflected a mindset of justification by works. A good God plus good works should guarantee a good life. If anybody could have boasted in the law, it was Job. His criteria for righteousness was entirely self-made. He had become his own God and thought he was earning all that he had. Job had this warped view of God, which was, as long as Job played by the rules, God was expected to bless him. It wasn't about a relationship with God, but was about Job's works and using that to get God to give Job what he really wanted. Job was not following God, but his own moral deeds. That is what he thought was blessing him, not God. Job was lost in moralism, the idea that one can earn their way into God's grace and blessings through moral deeds. Second point, God had a good reason to allow what happened to Job. In Job chapter 1, Satan comes before God, and God addresses him. Now we need to remember, before we read on, that this is God we're talking about. The Old and New Testament clearly shows that God is omniscient. So as Psalms 139 verse 4 says, Even before a word is spoken, God knows it. So God knows exactly what Satan's reply will be if he brings up Job. He knows already that if he mentions Job, Satan will want to go after him. So starting in verse 8, we read, And the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? There is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil. Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear God for no reason? Have you not put a hedge around him and his house and all that he has on every side? You have blessed the works of his hands, and his possessions have increased in the land. But stretch out your hand and touch all that he has, and he will curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your hand. Only against him do not stretch out your hand. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. Now perhaps I missed it, but where did God make a bet with Satan that Job would curse him if Satan was allowed to take away his wealth and family? In fact, we see the opposite. Verse 8, God says, Have you considered my servant Job? He is a righteous man. 
Verse 9 to 11, Satan replied, He only loves you because you bless him. Let me take it away and he won't anymore. Verse 12, God replies, Go and do it. There is no mentioning that God disagreed with Satan, and God totally preempted him and gave Job over to him. So what is going on here? In the book of Judges, there is a constant cycle going on. God's people rebel against him, and they chase after other gods. So God gives them over to other nations. The Israelites realize the turmoil that has brought them, and they cry out to God. Then God rescues them by sending a judge. This cycle goes on several times over hundreds of years. And one of the things the book is teaching us is when we decide to stop walking with God, when we decide we'd rather worship other things, God gives us over to them and stops walking with us. Because, quite frankly, we are choosing not to be with him. If we were to go to the extreme and downright reject him completely, he would let us go to chase after what we want. Paul says it like this in 2 Thessalonians 2, Because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved, therefore God sends them a strong delusion, so that they may believe what is false, in order that all may be condemned, who did not believe the truth, but had pleasure on righteousness. The Bible clearly teaches if we reject God, he will let us reject him and give us over to someone else. Following God is about a relationship, and if we outright reject that relationship, God lets us go. What happens in Judges is not to that extreme, though, because the Israelites realize their error and they come back to God. They don't completely reject him. They just fall away from him for a time. They don't reject him like some non-Christians do. So God didn't send them a delusion to believe, but lets the evil happen to them that they were chasing after, so that they realize their error and come back to him. Hebrews 12.6 and Proverbs 12.3 says God disciplines those who he loves like a father corrects his child. To those who want nothing to do with God, he gives them the delusion they want, so they can go their own way. But to those who want to follow God, but have lost their way, God will allow suffering to hit us, so that we will learn from it and come back to God. That is exactly what we see taking place in Job, with this conversation between Satan and God. God is speaking of Job, and calls him my servant. So although Job was clearly using God to get the things he wanted, and not seeking God just to be with him, God still had not given up on him, like he never gives up on us. But Job had lost his way. He had fallen off the right path from which he had started and began chasing after wrong desires. But unlike the Israelites in the book of Judges, Job fell away from God in the opposite way. What we traditionally think of what it means to rebel against God is to be like the prodigal son in Luke 15. You leave God and you go out into the world. You drink, you gamble, you party, you spend all your money on prostitutes. That is what every red-blooded American knows is what it means to rebel against God. That is what it means to be the opposite of a moralist, and what we will define here for our purposes as a hedonist. But what Jesus taught was that even though that is bad, there is a far more detrimental way to rebel against God, and that was to become a moralist. Jesus points out in the parable of the prodigal son, when he, the younger son, realizes the error of his ways and comes home, the father throws a celebration, but this upsets the older son. It says, now his older son was in the field, and as he came and drew near to the house... Okay, I, uh, we covered this. I told y'all, I actually gave you a... Uh, I actually told you a whole story on it. Um, Y'all remember, that, that was a wealthy Jewish farmer. He had two sons. And they had everything they had servants they had all the animals they had everything you could want they had money but the younger son wasn't satisfied and the younger son said i want i don't want to live this jewish lifestyle i want to go see what the world has to offer i want to go sow my yoke sow my real oats so uh give me my cut of the inheritance He's saying, give him his cut of the will. I want the money. The money, the land. Just give me my cut. So, it's a father and two sons. So, that's... He gets a third. So, they went out there and they counted every animal. They counted everything. And... It was given to him. And he left. Even a third of the servants. 
he sold everything that he had. He went down to the the marketplace that they had, you know. I guess you would say the pawn shop today. And he pawned everything. And he got a, a chest full of gold coins and got rubies and a diamond ring on his finger. And he went and got him a horse. And the man that asked him, do you want to invest in the market? And he said, nope. I just want to get out of here. And he spent all the money up. He, had, he stayed at a fancy hotel and partied and drank and paid for everybody and had loose women. And one day he went to that chest. There wasn't nothing there. Money was gone. So he sold his horse. And he was able to pay for another night. But the next day came. He had to leave. And he wound up selling everything. And still had to leave. Then he wound up working. Only job he could find. Was as a pig farmer. And you know. How the Jewish feel about swine. And he had to sit there. And feed the swine. And he was getting paid a penny a day. And he was sitting there and he was hungry and he was thinking about eating some of the slot that the pigs was eating. And then some said to him, hey, your father is rich. Why are you sitting here? He said, yeah, go home. So he started walking home and he had his fancy, he still had his fancy clothes on and he was walking and he was Feet was weighing through his shoes, and but he just kept walking. And finally, he hit his village. And he saw the village, and he just dropped down, and he was getting ready to hit the ground. He couldn't walk no more. And he fell right into his father's arms. Father caught him on the way down. He just happened to be in town that day. The father had him put up on a camel, and they took him back and he called for a celebration and said get the fattest calf we're gonna till it and we're gonna eat hearty tonight my son is home now the older son was like was out in the field and he didn't know what was going on he come back he had music and a party going on like what the heck so he asked the servant what's going on he said your younger brother came home and he's safe and we celebrating he got mad. Like, and? So he goes sit in the house and he pouting. The father come in there and say, well, you're not celebrating. Your younger brother is home and he's safe. God brought him back to us in one piece. He said, he sat there and squandered a third of all we own. I stayed here. And I worked on fields for you every day. Why should I care about my brother who went out there and messed around with heaters and prostitutes and he come back here and you treat him like he's a hero? I'm here every day and he's going to get another third because when you die, he's going to ask for half. So he's going to get, he already wasted a third of what we got. Now he's going to ask for half what we got. So why should I be celebrating? <clears throat> and the father told him, look, we got money. It'll come and go. But your brother left the protective home that we provided for y'all. And he made it back. And can't no animal replace him. He came back to us in one piece. He's not hurt. He's not damaged. He's not scarred. And in a year or two, he'll forget about what he went through. But he came back. 
takes a lot of courage for him to come back. And he said to me, Father, I have sinned. I understand if you don't want me back. But at least let me work for you. The young man learned the lesson. And he just walked back in here and said, hey, I'm back. And if you decide you want to do the same thing, you can. And I hope and pray every day and ask God to send you back to me in one piece. Because I want to see you two married and have families of your own. But if you got to go out there and soil your royal oats. I'm not going to stop you. But I hope that once you see, like he saw, that it ain't all it's cracked up to be and that you got it good right now. You don't need to go out there. But I'll give you the same opportunity. And hope that you come back like your brother did. So stop pouting. Let's get up and go celebrate. And that's what they did. And when he saw his brother, he forgot about all that. And he gave him a hug. And they played and partied and, and, and danced and ate and, and had a good time and drank and be merry. But the lesson was, sometimes you got to let somebody go. You got to let them see for themselves. You telling them, some people will say, I got you. And some people have to go experience it. Some people just, just got to go experience it. And you just got to be right there waiting for them to come back to you and hope that they come back to you the same way they left. That's all you can do. You can't make somebody. And Jesus and God understand that. They can't make you. You got to want it. And sometimes you got to hit your low. Sometimes it's not until they take everything from you. But in reality, you take it. You'll blame them, but you do, but you do it. Sometimes your health will go. Sometimes your family will go. But there's going to be something where you're going to hit rock bottom. And then you realize, I've been doing it my way, not their way. They know what's best for me. I don't. I'm just a dumb human. What do I know? Go to them. Ask them to come into your heart. Ask them to make you better than what you are. Just because you're successful doesn't mean you're better. Having success will make you proud. And when you're too proud to let them in, they let you go. So then when something bad happens, you can't come back. Oh, how did you let that happen? You running your own ship. Why you let something happen? Well, I can't control no earthquake. Then you shouldn't move to a place where they got earthquakes. Well, I can't control no tropical storm. Yes, if you want to do it on your own and you look, you got you your own God, then don't go crying to the real one when something go wrong. You made the decision. You can't hold him responsible for what you wanted to do. He let you go. 
He didn't handcuff you and say, nope, you're going to come with me. He said, no, you want to do you, do you. But don't cry when something go wrong. Don't cry when all of a sudden you ain't got no good luck. Don't, don't whine about it. Just deal with it. Because you want to be in control and in control. You want the responsibility? Be responsible. Let me check my chat real quick. We'll continue. Um, and hopefully him and Snaz we are both okay I made it through the storm safely yeah um Snazzy was here last night um he said uh and I will catch you tonight if we are alive headed to the hospital and she said I remember she's in she's in the states too I said, okay, Liz, hurry back, best wishes. And then she said, okay, Liz, be safe. Liz says, thank you, ladies. And she says, you're welcome. All right, Liz, um, good luck with the uh, delivery. And the baby, I hope it comes out healthy. Ten toes, ten fingers. Vision. Two ears. Nose. Mouth. You know, you pray for it to be healthy, but you... Like for it to have everything, you know. Now, I told y'all the story about the prodigal son. So let's see what what I said. How does that match up with what the scholar says? Here we go. He heard music and dancing, and he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, Your brother has come, and your father has killed the fattened calf, because he has received him back safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him. But he answered his father, Look, these many years I have served you, and I never disobeyed your command. Yet you never gave me a young goat that I may celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who had devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. See, what Jesus is saying is it is not the parable of the prodigal son, but the parable of the prodigal sons. They are both prodigal in completely opposite ways. The younger son rebels against God by going out to live the life of the rebellious hedonist. But the older rebels as a moralist. He doesn't go into the house to be with the father, but goes out, not into the world, but into the field of his own works. He goes to where he has built his identity, which is what he thinks he has done for God. When the father comes out to him, the only thing the older son can say is, look at all I've done for you and you never give me anything for it. Why won't you realize how good I am and how much I should have earned? Why don't you reward me for what I've done? See, it's all about him. He is using God to get the things he really wants, not using the things he has to love God. The older brother has rebelled against God and has gone out from him to be about his works and what he thinks he has earned through them. But like the younger brother, it is all about him, just in a different and more destructive way. Because the younger son realized his error. He came back. But the story ends in verse 32 open-ended. We don't know if the elder brother came back in or not, because it is harder for a moralist to realize they are prodigal than it is for a hedonist. Because the moralist looks at his works and says, look at all I did for God. God owes me now. I've not gone out from him like those sinners. I've earned it. And when you have that mentality, it is extremely hard to see yourself just as lost as a younger son. C.S. Lewis once said, Prostitutes are in no danger of finding their present life so satisfactory that they cannot turn to God. The proud, the avarious, the self-righteous are in that danger. The ones who don't see themselves as lost, but believe they have earned grace and blessings, are in far more danger of being lost in themselves. And we have seen that Job had that exact same mentality. It is not about God, but using God to get the things he wants. Yes. Pause. That was explosive right there. They just said a prostitute, a pimp, a drug dealer, a, a murderer know what they're doing is wrong. 
and are more likely or are easier to repent and have them come to God than somebody who thinks they're morally superior. Because in their mind, they haven't done no wrong. And therefore, they should be blessed and given everything. And they shouldn't have to ask. And they should automatically just be accepted and give everything. And they automatically should get to the next level. These are your people that's in the most danger. Because they think, well, you know, I don't do them things. And, you know, I, I'm better than them, you know. And I'm realizing I'm going to, it ain't the same. But I can use myself as a guinea pig again. In my heart of hearts, I believe that we cover more issues and that we have better content than most of the people on YouTube. But to the viewer, they would rather see the drama. They would rather see the cussing and fussing and the doxing. And that to them is exciting. I'm never going to attract those people unless I do what they want me to do doesn't do any good to say look at all this great stuff you missing like this sermon today it's life changing if y'all really listening it's life changing but if don't nobody care what good is going around saying hey Look at the great content I'm bringing back out. Don't nobody care about it. So should I say, well, yes, why y'all heathens and y'all going to be the same thing? Then I'm no better than they are. Well, maybe I should just stop. But if I believe the people really need to hear it, why would I stop? If I believe that the Spirit is telling me to come help these people, even though they don't want the help, the Spirit is telling me to keep going. So do I play moralist and say, well, they're not paying me no mind, so why should I keep going? Then I'm not doing what I'm being told. I'm not being doing what I was sent here to do. So I have to keep going. And I have to keep my mind open. I can't, well, you know, you can't do nothing with these people. They're no good when... When you start doing that, you know better than they are. Anybody have, have any comments before we move on? Where we at? It's only two people watching? That's rough right there. Turn to himself and his works. I earned all this because I did the right prayers. I lived the right life. It was all done because I worked the system perfectly. And God says, no, you haven't. You've left me. You've started chasing after self-fulfilling desires. And I will give you over to the father of greed, whom you truly follow. God gave Job over to Satan to get him to realize he was lost in himself in his own righteousness, and not in God's righteousness and love. He became a moralist and was just as prodigal as a hedonist. Third point, this book has a deep and important warning for Christians. 
As we can see from the story of the prodigal sons, and from the whole gospel in general, when Jesus came, he didn't come to convict hedonists and praise moralists. He came to convict both sides. The way the world looks at the Bible is that moralism is what God wants, and hedonism is what God hates. So get on the moralist side and you'll make God happy. But Jesus said this is wrong. He said both sides are wrong. Both sides are prodigal and lost in pride, just in different ways, and both sides need to come to repentance. But instead we have this divide, the hedonists say the moralists are the trouble with the world today, and the moralists say the hedonists are the trouble with the world today. And Jesus says, you are both the trouble with the world today. But one of the interesting things is if you read through the Gospels, is that Jesus spent more time with the people the moralists of his day hated. He spent more time teaching the underprivileged, the tax collectors, sinners, and prostitutes. And when he encountered moralists, like the Pharisees, his words were hardly kind. In fact, one can say that Jesus had a harsher message for those lost in moralism than those lost in hedonism. Jesus was constantly calling them out and pointing out how they may be clean on the outside. They're destroying themselves on the inside. In Matthew 23, Jesus says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you clean the outside of the cup and the plate, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and the plate, that the outside may also be clean. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you are like whitewashed tombs, which outwardly appear beautiful, but within are full of dead people's bones and all uncleanliness. So you also outwardly appear righteous to others, but within you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. What Jesus is saying is that although the moralists may appear to be following God, they're really rejecting Him and assuming their moral deeds will save them, that they can earn God's grace and blessing because they work for it. But that very attitude means you are living for yourself, just like one in hedonism. Instead of living to please the lower desires, the moralist lives to please his desire to earn something and be a self-made person. He has built himself up and now God owes him. And this is far more dangerous for a psyche than living in hedonism. When someone lost in the world hits rock bottom, they can come to realize they need Jesus because they are clearly doing things which have distanced them from God, like the Israelites did throughout Judges. But a moralist fills himself constantly with self-righteousness and the idea that he is really doing God's work. Instead of the moralist realizing he needs Jesus, he is lost in his field of works and is constantly comparing himself to others. The mentality goes like this. God needs to help those evil sinners out there in the world. This world would be better off if more people were like me. Moralists don't think they need grace or Jesus to rescue them. Clearly, they assume, they are already doing God's work. They can pull themselves up by their bootstraps and better themselves. Moralism can easily get lost in this cycle of pride, where no matter what happens, it's all about you. You messed up, now you do the work to fix it. But it is never about Jesus. It is never about His grace, and knowing that that is why we are saved. It is not because of what we have done, but what Jesus has done for us. And although moralism can manifest itself in non-Christians who claim to be good without God, if we Christians are honest, we need to admit that we fall into this daily. We Christians claim to follow Jesus and have been saved by grace, but it is so easy to lose sight of that and think we've earned it. It is so easy to compare ourselves to hedonists and look down on them. The mentality goes like this. The problem with the world is all that sin out there. Those hedonists need to fix themselves and start living decent lives. If they were more like us, they would be better off. That is why Jesus loves us and hates them. But see, by thinking this, we have fallen prey to pride and self-worth and think it is all about us. It is so easy to fall into this mentality and think God loves us more because we act better than those hedonists out there. Why would he prefer them to us? But what the book of Job is warning us is that is completely false. God is no respecter of persons. And in doing this, we are just as lost as those people we say we are better than. But now we can't see it because we compare ourselves to hedonists and say, well, I'm better off than them, so I'm safe. But in actuality, we are lost in pride and self-worth, but are unable to notice it. It is so easy to switch our focus away from Christ and to the works we do. This is why moralism is far more dangerous than hedonism. If you compare Judges to Job, 
All the Israelites needed was to be captured by another nation. But for the moralist, Job, for God to wake him up, look at what God has to allow to get him to realize he is lost. He loses everything, deals with bickering from friends, and then God has to come himself to wake him up. Moralism is such a poison that God has to go to unbelievable lengths to save Job from it. It is far more destructive for the soul than hedonism could ever be. This is why some who were lost in moralism were so far gone that Jesus didn't even try to win them over. In Matthew 15, Jesus says, Let them alone. They are blind guides. And if the blind lead the blind, both will fall into the pit. Some were so lost in their own pride and their moral record that Jesus didn't even try. They were too self-absorbed, too focused on how good they thought they were. So what Job shows us is if we fall into moralism, it is actually taking us further from God than we could ever suspect. Job is a warning to Christians that although we may think we are doing the will of God and are far better than hedonists, if we fall into the moralist attitude, we are actually lost in pride and find it harder to realize it. C.S. Lewis said, The sins of the flesh are bad, but they are the least bad of all sins. All the worst pleasures are purely spiritual. The pleasure of putting other people in the wrong, of bossing, of patronizing and spoiling sport, and backbiting, the pleasure of power, of hatred, for these are two things inside of me, competing with the human self, which I must try to become. They are the animal self and the diabolical self. The diabolical self is the worst of the two. This is why a cold, self-righteous prig who goes regularly to church may be far nearer to hell than a prostitute, but of course, it is better to be neither. It is far easier to see yourself as a sinner who needs grace and hedonism than it is in moralism, and Job is there to warn us of that. Moralists need grace just as much as hedonists do. They need to realize they are prideful fools who look down on others and worship themselves. But for Christians, those who truly want to seek God and not absolute moralism, we can rest on the assurance that if we are lost and need to be put back on the right path, God will show up in our lives and do whatever it takes to get us there. God disciplines those who he loves like a father disciplines a child. Throughout the rest of Job, his friends try to figure out what he has done to deserve punishment. God has to be punishing Job because of some specific sin. Job keeps claiming he has done nothing wrong, and God shouldn't have let this happen. Then at the end, God shows up and says in so many words, Job, who are you and who am I? Job, look at all I've done and still do. I am all-powerful. I am all-knowing. Who am I? God goes through a long list, showing his greatness, all in an effort to get Job to ponder the question, Who is God, and who is he? In chapter 40, Job responds and says in so many words, Look, I'm sorry, I never should have accused you of doing wrong. I won't do it anymore. But God keeps going. Why? Because Job still doesn't get it. God was not upset about the action of accusing God, but the motive behind it. Just like God doesn't only want good actions, but also right motives behind them to carry out our good actions. God is trying to get Job to think about the differences between who he is and who God is, and in doing so, trying to get him to realize something that is taught throughout scripture, which is, no Job, you still don't get it. It is not about what you have done or can do. You can't appease me with your works. They are nothing but filthy rags. I am not a divine genie. I don't serve you for appeasing me with your works and sacrifices. I give and I take. Nothing you have ever done will ever earn that or force me to bend to your works. I create beauty and wonder through my wisdom and power, and you have done nothing to create any of this. You are only here because I sustain and love you. You have done nothing to earn this. This is all because of my love. Now realize who I truly am and stop using me as a means to an end. See me for who I am and not what you think you can get out of me. God wants Job to realize he is personal. He is active. He is not some robotic genie that is to be used to get what we want out of life. He wants to be loved as he loves us. And finally, in chapter 42, Job gets it. He says, I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore, I have uttered what I did not understand. Things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. Hear, and I will speak. I will question you, and you make it known to me. I had heard of you by hearing of the ear, but now my eyes see you. Therefore, I despise myself, 
and repent in dust and ashes. Job says flat out, I know you can do all things, and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Job finally realizes it was God who blessed him out of love, and not because Job had earned it. Up until this point, Job had only heard of God, but now he sees God, and sees he is not a thing to be used, but as a personal being, who does things out of love, and one should not treat God like a divine vending machine, but realize who he is. He is a being of love and personality, who knows what is best for us, and will do whatever it takes to get us there. And we see that moralism is so dangerous for us, that God will go to a great depth to rescue us from it. The important thing to remember here is no one was right but God. Job was lost in his own moralism, and didn't think God had any grounds to allow what happened. Job's friends thought he was serving out punishment because of some particular sin, and if he repented, that would appease God and he would get everything back. Even Satan was wrong here. Satan thought that Job had never loved God and built his identity on his wealth and his health. And if he could take that away, he would reveal Job's true colors. But what God knew was that Job didn't build his true identity on those things. He had only lost his way and began to focus on how he thought he was able to obtain those things. It isn't until Job realizes that his formula didn't work, that he didn't want to live anymore. Job had turned to his own moral goodness, and by God allowing his things to be taken that Job thought he had earned from his good works, God could use that to wake him up. This is something we need to remember here. The whole time, God was still in control. He only permitted Satan to go so far, and he kept him on a tight leash. As Tim Keller says, God only gave Satan enough rope to hang himself. Satan wanted to destroy Job, but God used it to benefit Job. Satan thought Job worshipped his possessions, but God knew that Job, his servant, had lost his way, and that he would use this to bring Job back to himself and prevent him from being lost in his own pride and moralism. So no matter what we may face, the book of Job reminds us that God is still in control and has never forsaken us, but as always, has a bigger and grander picture in mind. God knows exactly what matters and is willing to go to extreme depths to bring it out for our benefit and for the benefit of those around us. See, it's not always about us. Don't go away with the idea here that suffering you may face is all about you. God will use your experiences to help others as well. Or more important, don't think this is how God will always respond to moralism. If you look at Job with a new formula in mind, that a good God plus moralism equals Job's situation of pain and suffering, then you are falling into the opposite picture than its intent. As it shows, God is not a formula that can be tricked to get good things and stay away from bad times. God knows each person is uniquely different and has a uniquely different life, so the trials we face will not always be the same or for the same reasons. But look at how Job ends and how it benefits others. God uses Job for the sake of his friends as well. He turns to them and says they have not spoken what is right about him, but he offers grace. He says for Job to pray for them and help them atone. So obviously from this text, we need to quickly point out that doing good things, like sacrificing to God to atone, is not bad. But what is in question is the motive behind our good actions. God obviously shows here it is good to do good things, like repent and atone. But also the point is, it is equally important to have the right motive behind them to carry out our good actions. So are we doing the good, praying, and lifting up sacrifices to appease God in an attempt to earn his favor? Or are we doing these good things to seek repentance and get closer to God? And this is what God wants from us. Not a list of works we do to try to earn God. Oh, Lord. Well, hopefully today we'll have a commercial. Blessing. But God working with us, like how God was working with Job here, in many different ways to bring forgiveness and restoration to this world. It's good. It's good. <laughs> a wonderful thing. Oh, you're gonna get a flag now. Oh, you're gonna get a flag now. All right, all right. <laughs> all righty, y'all. Uh... All righty, y'all. Uh... I played a little bit of this on the uh on that that gimme channel to see if we would get flagged and I knew we wouldn't. Um we still went over two hours and five minutes. Said I was gonna try and keep it to an hour and a half. So I'm not gonna keep y'all, but um Mm-hmm. 
Wait a minute, where, where's the driver at? The driver said Job had a lot of faith. It said it shows you that Satan cannot move without God allowing him. But uh, the driver, but you missed the point. Yes, Job had faith, but he had faith in his actions. He had faith in what he was doing. He didn't have faith in God. He didn't know God. He just knew of a God. It'd be like, say you moved into a new house and you rent it. You didn't rent it from the landlord. You rented it from one of his workers. So you get to the place and you say, you know, the landlord's coming by to meet me next month. I got a month to get ready. You don't contact the landlord or, you, or the people around him and say, what does he like? Instead, you say, well, I'm going to make these improvements and I'm going to make it look like I think he would like it. That man might come there and say, what have you done to my house? And might put you out of it. See, you doing works trying to appease somebody you don't know. And you're doing things that in your mind you think are going to make him happy. And then therefore he might not raise your rent every year. Or he might let you run a better place when his lease is up. You're doing things. But you don't know the man. The man might like the house the way it is. The, the stuff you do to it might piss him off. And at least it might say, do not alter the premises. But you, not knowing this man, just knowing of him, you spend your time and your efforts trying to impress somebody but you don't know them if you took the time to know the landlord then you might say well he might enjoy me doing this but you would know him job did not know god he did not know jesus he just knew of him And he's trying to impress somebody who he doesn't know. He's still trying to impress somebody who he doesn't know. So, you know... Like I was saying earlier, I, I, I'm going to go get some money to the orphanage. I'm going to go. But are you doing it because you really want to do it? Or are you doing it so people can pat you on the back and say, good job? This is what the book of God, the book of Job is trying to say. That. As bad as heathens are, the only thing that's worse is people that think that they better because of acts that they're doing. But they won't take the time to get to know Jesus and God and find out what they want for them. Instead, you're going to decide what you want to do for them instead of asking them, well, what would you like me to do? But 
bring being proud and boastful and acting like you morally superior to the people who you see is low down and beneath you you drawing yourself further away from God Because he loves all. Yeah, he said his servant. He he didn't say my child. He didn't say he didn't say my friend. He didn't say my confidant. He said my servant. Job down here doing all these things. Thinking that he's serving God and ain't, ain't asked God nothing. Satan thought that he was going to put fear in God. When he, when he said, let me have him. God said, go ahead. <laughs> Now, to you or I, like I said in the beginning, why would you offer the best thing you have to your enemy? Job was not the best thing that he had. A lowly, handicapped, Bum sitting in the grass, getting ate up by bugs. That's walking with Jesus and God. That talks to them. Is worth more than ten jobs. Job was a dime a dozen. He was a dime a dozen. He's thinking, I'm going to do and say the right things. And that's going to make God have to bless me. He's going to have to take me to the next level. I ain't got to acknowledge him. I ain't got to talk to him. I ain't got to show my, I'm just going to do everything perfectly. And then that should translate into me getting somewhere. That's what Job thought. So Job did not belong to Jesus and God. He didn't connect. Driver said, that's what I thought. He was a man, but he had a lot of faith in the things that he did, the driver, he didn't have faith in God because he didn't know him. He only knew of him. And even when he lost everything, he didn't go to God and say, why, Lord, have you done this to me? Why have you forsaken me? Why have you let this happen? He sat there and said, well, God giveth and God giveth away. I guess I got to go work harder. I got to go do more things. He didn't come to God and say, hey, why are you doing this to me? He didn't acknowledge God at all. It's almost as if you take a situation where you see something needed in the neighborhood and you go fix it. And then the next day you found out the people in the town and went to the mayor and asked you to get kicked out. So when they come to throw you out, you go, hey, I just did all these great things. What are you doing? 
People are going to say, <laughs> we didn't know. We wanted you to get out. We didn't know you were doing these things. You ain't never came and told me nothing. We thought you didn't like us. Wait a minute. Uh oh, wait. did we get flying? Did we get flying? Why does it say we offline? Nah, we still here. Driver, you need to rewind back and see the beginning of the video. You, you coming in here in, in the beginning. But okay. All right. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was blameless and upright, and one who feared God and shunned evil. Now, if you would have been here for the video, you would know that we also look at Noah. Matter of fact, I want you to remember that though. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was blameless and upright, and one who feared God and shunned evil. I want you to remember that, but I'm, I'm gonna bring it back. Hold on, let me bring up another page. Let me hit Noah. Noah one. Let's see what. I, I don't want Noah 532. Can we, can we get Noah 1? Hold on. How you, how you go back? Wait a minute. Well, they gave us the whole thing. Skip ahead again. Okay, skip ahead. All right. Now, driver, look at your screen now, sir. I want you to see something. So let's go back to the other screen. There was a man in the land of us whose name was Job. And that man was blameless and upright and one who feared God and shunned evil, right? Now let's go take a look at how Noah is described. Noah was a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time. And he walked faithfully with God. Let's go back. There was a... Man with name was Job. That man was blameless and upright, and one who feared God and shunned evil. Let's go back and look at it again. Blameless among the people of his time, and he
He walked faithfully. Noah walked faithfully with God. Job did not walk with God. Noah feared God. Noah knew of God. But Noah did not walk with God. And if you don't walk with God, you are not claimed by God. You are expendable. So what, what obligation does God have to you or Jesus when you don't take advantage of that grace and come to them Instead, you want to do everything on your own. Then you deal with your problems on your own. You deal with natural disasters on your own. You deal with the demons on your own. You want to do it on your own. Well, I'm going to do this and I'm going to get in there. I'm going to offer these sacrifices. And I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. But you don't come to Jesus and God. So you actually separate yourself from them more so than the people who you look down upon. Yeah, at least I ain't like them, you know. I know I'm going to get blessed. I ain't doing that. I ain't out there robbing and raping. I ain't out there selling drugs. I ain't out there killing people, you know. But some of them people that's doing that, when they get caught, They'll seek a relationship with God. But you, who's so righteous, think that your righteous actions, your good behavior, is enough that you don't have to acknowledge a relationship with God. And so you grow farther apart from God. So why should he protect you. Why should he care about you? You don't care about him. Now you're saying go to job 1-8. Alright. Wait a minute. No, that's just job 2. Hold on. Okay, it must be inside. Wait a minute. Yeah, it is. Where is when he? The Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? That there is no one like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and shuns evil. I ain't, I ain't see him say he walking with him. That's number one, sir. But two... You don't think that God knew that if he threw Job in his face, that Satan wouldn't jump at the chance to show he's smarter than God. So let's look at this again. The Lord said to Satan, from where do you come? So Satan answered the Lord and said, from going to and fro on the earth and from walking back and forth on it. The Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, who fears God and shuns evil. Where does God say he walk with him? Then the Lord said to Satan, have you, cons I'm sorry, Satan answered the Lord and said, does Job fear God for nothing? 
have you not made a hedge around him, around his household, and around all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands, and his possessions have increased in the land. But now, stretch out your hand and touch all that he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your power. Only don't lay a hand on his person. So Satan left the presence of the Lord. Now this is when he's losing everything. Job arose, tore his robe, shaved his head, and fell to the ground and worshipped. And he said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I shall return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And all this job did not sin, nor charge God with wrong. You don't see a problem with that. You don't see a problem with that. Hold on, driver. We at one eight now. I'm sorry. Where are we at right now? We are down here at 22. And all this job did not sin nor charge God with any wrong. Wait a minute. Hold on a sec, the driver. Hold on a sec. If somebody does something to you for no reason, aren't you going to ask that person, why did you do it? Aren't you going to ask, why? Why didn't Job ask God why? Because Job never talked to God. He only talked about him. Never to him. God doesn't know him. That's why it was easy to hand him over to the devil and say, well, go ahead. I'm, I'm going to make a point off of you, dummy, but go ahead. Go ahead, dummy. Go ahead and strike him. This will let me leave something to the people on earth. Maybe they'll get this. Some would say that Job was the best man on earth. But Job was no better than a bum. Because neither one of them have a relationship with God or Jesus. The bum might not know about God or Jesus. But Job does. Job know about God and why he ain't make a relationship with him. If all of a sudden everything happened in one day, I lose everything and I'm on top of the world. Hey, what's going on? God, talk to me. What did I do wrong? I'm doing everything that I was taught to do about how I'm supposed to be as a man. I offer sacrifices to you every day for myself, for my family, for my kids, for my servants in case they've done anything wrong. Why has Val forsaken me in this time of need? That ain't what he said. He said the Lord gave him, the Lord take it away. Oh, well, I guess I got to go around it again. Or just die. That's what he said. Job was not walking with God. That's the point of this video. The laws that were given by Moses, Job followed each one to the letter. And he thought that doing so, just that alone, that God owed him to be blessed 
that God owed him to go to the next level. He did everything but the one thing he should have done first. Create a relationship with God. If he'd have had a relationship with God, God would have not suggested him to Satan. But Job is no closer than somebody who don't know God, never heard of him, but is doing wrong. Because when that person do hear of him, they might say, you know, maybe I ought to come find God. But a person like Job is going to say, I'm doing everything I'm supposed to be doing and, you know, that's all I got to do is just keep doing this over and over again. I keep doing these uh, wonderful works and I'm going to get in there. Works without faith. But that's works and faith ain't enough. You can have faith. I can say, hey, I, I, I believe in Jesus. And go right out there and, and be killing people. Or cheating people. Or robbing people. But I can say, hey, I believe. I'm on Team Jesus, hey, Jesus. But if I set up a relationship, because you need to have a relationship with Jesus to get to God. So even though Job might have been what we down here might say, a goody two shoes, he doesn't know. I believe that he blessed them because he was waiting. Job did everything right except for one thing. He didn't create a relationship with God. He talks about God. To other people but never actually talks to God and it's not until he get down to the to the boils then all of a sudden he starts to blame God then later on he actually talked to God God came down there and got him that's how much that's how much God wanted Job to get the message that God even came down there. And then when Job apologized, God still kept going. You keep talking about you did some sacrifices. You helped some people out. God darn it. I make the goddamn grass grow. I make the daggone sun come out. I make the moon come and see you at night so you can see how to walk. I make the earth spin on its axis so you got day and night. I make this. I make the seas. What have you done? I don't owe you nothing. You owe me. And all I ask from you is to come build a relationship with me. That's all I ask from you. These people down here see you as something big. You, you ain't, you just a damn another person than me. So the people that's going around, ha oh, look at them. I'm so much better than them. I know I'm going. You don't know God and Jesus. You ain't going nowhere. I've been a nun for 35 years. I've never touched sin a day in my life. 
uh, do you have a relationship with God and Jesus? Then you're going in a lake of fire. You can talk all day. You know, I follow every letter of the law. I even got the clothes on, never shaved my head, never shaved the four corners of my bed. I keep my wife covered up and my daughter. I'm going, you're going right into the lake of fire. You don't have that connection with Jesus and God. You ain't going nowhere. Stop talking about what you could do. If you could do it, what you need Jesus and God for? If you could do it, if you could do it yourself, why do we need a God? Half of us can't stop smoking or can't stop drinking. Can't stop sleeping around. We shown we can't run ourselves. We can't govern ourselves. So you turn yourself over to the person who made you. And let them direct your life. And if you ain't doing it, you're going to hell. And ain't nothing you can say. You're going to the lake of fire. You can talk to me all day and make all the excuses. Oh, but I did this not If you don't know Jesus and God. Because you ain't got to do none of that. All you got to do is have a relationship with Jesus and God. Why is that so hard to understand? You ain't got to do none of that stuff. That's not more important than your relationship with Jesus and God. And I'm going to tell you, that's the reason why church leaders are going to be the first ones to get thrown in that lake. Because they think, I'm preaching the word of God. And, eh, I'm so much better than everybody else. And God done it. I know the truth. And, but they're not walking with God. They have made themselves into gods. Because they think that by their works, that they are actually being drawn closer to God when actually they're drawing themselves away because they're saying, my, what I'm doing, what I'm doing is what's going to make it happen. I've already shown you that you can't do anything. You can't do anything. If you did, then Jesus died for nothing. What did Jesus go down here and die for? If you could do it, he died for nothing. You need to come to Jesus and let him come into your heart. Activate your Holy Spirit and let him mold you into what he wants you to do if you're not doing that you don't belong to him you don't belong to him then there's no way for you to get to god so you can be innocent and you can wait you can you know i don't do nothing wrong i've never sinned and or they don't know you they haven't claimed you so you're expendable Well, that's so hard to believe. I'll give you I'll give you an example. Let's say you have a beautiful young child. And say he's outside playing. And another child comes along that you don't know. And starts playing with him. Say two pit bulls come come attack the boys. Which child are you gonna grab for first? You gonna grab your child and get him safely in the house, or are you gonna grab the child you don't know? 
and get them safe in your house. I like to think you grab your child first and then go back and try to help the other child. So why shouldn't Jesus claim the people that's walking with him? Why is he obligated to claim people he don't know and, and, and won't take the time? It's so easy, but they won't take the time to get to know him. Why should he care? I'm mad at him. You would go get your child first and then go back and see about the other child. So when you say that y'all did everything right, okay, they let him do what he's doing. But they don't know him. And the fact that he lost everything in one day in one swoop. And he didn't say, all right, now, come on, God. what? Come on, God. What you doing to me now? I ain't done everything right. How could you know? He said, this area, you know, God giveth and God taketh away. Then he got his wife coming. Why don't you curse God and die? You obviously did something wrong. Then the friends come. What are you doing wrong? You done something wrong. He is doing something wrong. He don't know. A man who he supposed to be scared of, he don't know. Y'all know that in every neighborhood, there's always a family of fighters. And you'll hear some little runt. It's always the run of the group running his mouth. And he about to get beat up. And somebody will come up and say, oh, you don't want to do that because uh, you don't know what his family like. Oh, I don't care. I'm going to beat this run up. Now, if you touch this little runt, his family members are going to beat the crap out of you. You're going to say, I don't know nothing about him. I don't know nothing about this runt. Person going to say, but I do. And I know as much as loud as he talk, that's all he is. Just let him go about his business. But if you put your hands on him, his family is going to come see you. See, the person tell, talking to you is telling you, I know. You don't know. All you know is that you see this little runt in front of you and you want to knock him out. God is trying to tell you, I know what's going to happen. Because he knows the people. You don't know him. And so you go ahead, you knock the dude out. He wake up, he go home, he tell his family. They all come out with the gun. They kick your door in. And they beat the crap out of you and your family. Somebody was trying to tell you not to do it, that they knew you didn't want to hit. In your mind, you got every right to knock this little run out. And now you and your family paying the consequences. You think you know everything about God and Jesus and you haven't spent no time talking to them, letting them get to know you. You, you, you just an, an, another human being. They don't know you. They don't. That's why Jesus said in Matthew, a lot of people are going to be standing there on, you know, in front of him on that book of altar with that book in front of him saying, you know me, I've prophesied in your name, I've done miracles, 
in my work for you, I've done great things for people. They're going to say, I don't know you. You mean you don't know me? I don't know you. You never had a relationship with me. Next. Throw me in like a fire. Your works cannot get you. Nothing can take nothing can take the place of the relationship between you, Jesus, and God. You got to get to know Jesus so Je and let Jesus in so Jesus can clean you up. Jesus is going to clean you up and then he's going to hide all your imperfections from God. And when God look down, he's not going to see your nasty butt. He's going to look through Jesus and see you and you'll be acceptable. And if you have not done that, you're going into the lake of fire and there's no if, ands, or buts. You can't shortcut it. You can't weasel your way out. Well, I did this. I did that. It don't matter if you're not doing that. Now, now Job did not do this. That's why it says he feared God, but didn't say he was walking with him. Didn't say he knew him. He knew of him. Now, if the man didn't have a sense to get to know Jesus and God, at least he was doing everything he supposed to be doing. Why would they not want to see him succeed? But at the same time, he's not going. They know he got potential. They don't want to let him go. There are a lot of people like that. And Job is the example. Job is the example to the rest of us. When I was looking at this today, I was so embarrassed. As a man who's gone door to door, as a man who's counseled at least 100 people, as a man who did attend Bible college, as a man that's ordained by three different religious institutions, I was shocked today. I was shocked today. And I'm trying to tell y'all this. I was shocked today. The book of Job is for our benefit. If you're not talking And acknowledging their existence, why should they claim you? If you're not acknowledging their existence, why should they claim you? Anybody else have any questions? Oh, he said to look at um eight twelve. Well, let's see. Are you are you talking about um eight twelve or the line eight to twelve? Well, let's go see what eight is. That's three, four, five. Six, seven, eight. All right, where's where's eight twelve? I don't know if we meant eight two twelve. No, he wasn't talking about that.
Remember we talking about line eight to twelve. So let's go back. Let's go back to eight to twelve. Let's see what he was talking about. We already um we covered that. We already covered this. The job fear God for nothing. Have you not made a hedge around him, around his household, and around all that he has on every side? You bless the work of his hands. Okay. But here's the thing. Satan says he will surely curse you to your face. Job has not said anything to God's face. That's the problem. And the devil too simple to understand that. That that's the problem. Now, let's go here to two. Satan attacked Job's health. Again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves for the Lord, and Satan came also among them to present himself for the Lord. And the Lord said to Satan, From where did you come? Satan said, From going to and fro on the earth, from walking back and forth on it. The Lord said to Satan, If you consider my servant Job, there is no one like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, who fears God and shuns evil. And he still holds fast to his integrity, although you incited me against him to destroy him without cause. So Satan answered the Lord and said, Skin for skin, yes, all that a man has he will give for his life. But stretch out your hand now and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will surely curse you to your face with painful boils from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head, and he took for himself a pot shirt in which to scrape himself while he sat in the midst of ashes. Then his wife said to him, Do you still hold fast to your integrity? Curse God and die. But he said to her, You speak as one of, as one of the foolish women speaks. Shall we indeed not accept good for God, and shall we not accept adversity? And all in all, Job did not sin with his lips. There's a difference. Before it said he was still upright and did not sin at all. Now it just says sin with his lips. So now he's getting mad. Now he's getting mad at God. But why ain't he saying it? Why won't he say it? Now his friends come and they sat with him for seven days and seven nights and nobody said a word. And after this, Job opened his mouth and cursed the day of his birth. And now he's talking about, uh, I cursed the day I was born and the mother that made me and all that stuff. Why I ain't died? Bro. Now he's talking about dying. Then, then, Eli, then Eliphaz comes by and says, you have sinned. And 
Eliphaz is chastised by God. So let me back up. Now, Eliphaz is saying, whoever purrs for being innocent or where the upright ever cut off. Those who plow inequity and sow trouble reap the same. By the blast of God, they perish, and by the breath of his anger, they are consumed. The roaring of the lion, the voice of the fair lion, and the teeth of the young lions are broken. Now he's sitting there saying, can a man be more righteous than God? Can a man be, be more pure than his maker if he put no trust in his servants? How much more than those who dwell in the house of clay whose foundation is in the dust? Who are crushed before moth, they are broken in pieces from morning to evening. They perish forever with no one regarding. Does not their own excellence go away? They die even without wisdom. Now, God come back. God is chastising Eliphaz. God is answering. Call out now. Is there anyone who will answer you? To who, which of the holy ones will you turn? For wrath kills a foolish man, and, e and envy slays a simple one. But I have seen the foolish taking root. But suddenly I curse this dwelling place. His sons are far from safety. They are crushed in the gate, and there is no deliverer. Because the hungry eat up his harvest, taking it even from the thorns, and a snare snatches their substance. God darn, this is going on. on. I ain't reading all that. God darn. But the point is already made. There are a lot of people that think that they doing right. But if you don't have that relationship with God, it's all for naught. Because you're doing all these things to impress God but you won't come to God. You're doing all these things to impress God, but you won't come to him. You talk at him, you talk about him, but you won't talk with him. Let that marinate for a second. You'll talk at him. You'll talk about him. You'll talk to other people about them, but you won't talk with them. And that's the key. He seeks a relationship with you. He wants to call you his own. All you got to do is let Jesus in. Build that relationship with Jesus. He'll extend to God. But you got to do it. If you don't do it, ain't nothing you can do with your hands. Ain't no manipulating. Ain't nothing you can do. If you don't do it, you're done. And that's it, pure and simple. If you don't do it, you're done. So uh, let me check one thing before we get out of here. Thanks, everybody, that came by and watched the sermon. I held you up for three hours now. Hoping to, I promised an hour and a half, but hey, we only do this on Sundays and Wednesdays, so you know, let's get it in. So uh, let's go ahead to the minister, Brother Derek, and let's see how we got our watch hours yet. It says it's still not enabled. Let's go in. Cause they had it said uh, 65. 
So let's see. Da, 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 da. They're going to bless us with our hours. Nope. Still saying 39.65. It's 4 in the afternoon. Where's our watch hours at? Why are they holding us back? It's ridiculous right here. We, we know we got them. I don't know why they won't bless us. But patience. Patience, young grasshopper, as they say. Patience. Patience. Let's come back. So they still ain't gave us our watch hours yet. Why? I don't know. But they won't give them. Now your job did everything right. And why would you not want to give a chance to somebody that does everything right? He did everything right, but secret relationship. He did everything right, but secret relationship with God. That's what Job was missing. So why wouldn't he want somebody that's doing everything that the law says why wouldn't he want them to prosper and be an example to the others? But at the same time, Job is doing everything right but establishing a relationship with God. He's thinking that he's doing all these things and these things is going to like handcuff God. And you know what? Well, man won't never talk to me, but I guess, you know, he ain't done everything in the law except seek me, uh, you know. And, and I guess we can go ahead and bless him, let him be an example, but, you know. But the, the, uh, the event was still the same. You can be a goody two-shoes your whole life. You ain't got no relationship. You going to lake of fire and there you go i can't make it more simpler i can't break it down no more than that that's the key for anything else meaning if you wasn't doing any of those things and you established a relationship with god and you let jesus in your heart they're going to direct you where what they want you to do so you don't have to do all these thingies and these thingies and these thingies and these works. They're going to direct you where they want you to go. You all understand? So all right, y'all. I'm going to go to the stove. It's a beautiful day outside at 65 degrees. And dang, let's get ready to get dark. We stayed on too long. But that's all right. It's still nice weather. I'll go out there. Get my riding on. So um, I'll be live again. It's uh, 4.30. I be leaving out about uh, 5.45. So be looking for me, y'all, on the Minister Derek channel. I will be live. Thanks for watching, everybody. God bless you all. Get that relationship going. Trust me, you won't you will not regret it. Peace everybody.